San Juan Capistrano, California, an organization dedicated to the biblical principle, to each man an answer. Today's program, The Kingdom of the Occult, Part 1. Now, here's your host, Dr. Walter Martin. Thank you and welcome to today's program, The Kingdom of the Occult, Part 1. We'll be devoting this entire program to the subject of witchcraft, including its origins and where it's at today. Along the way, we'll be providing you with a thoroughly documented history of American witchcraft dating back to the early 1600s, a time period which was a very difficult one in American history. While preparing the material for this program, our staff visited Salem, Massachusetts, where much of the demonic activity of witchcraft started on the American continent. We'll take you to the exact location where it most probably started, and we'll be dispelling some of the rumors and myths that have been a part of our folklore over the years regarding this provocative subject. When we visited Salem, we talked with a local Christian pastor who offered some very interesting insights into what's happening there today. And we'll bring you that interview later in this program. Then we'll be talking also to two people, Mary Harold and Mike Warnicke, both of whom were formerly witches and who are now Christians. They'll describe some of the rituals they were involved in as well as giving a clear warning as to why Christians should never become involved in witchcraft. First, however, before we begin, a definition of terms is in order. What is occultism? It's a common Latin word referring to the hidden or the secret mysterious things which are always forbidden by God. It always involves some form of religion and has something to do with the supernatural in whatever context you find it. The kingdom of the occult is built on one word, experience. It's not built on revealed authority such as we rely on through our relationship with God as revealed in his word, the Bible. Witchcraft is directly connected to occultic practices and is an abomination to God by his own proclamation. But what exactly is a witch? A witch is a male or a female who uses occultic powers for supposedly good or evil ends. Hence, we have the designation, which many of you may have heard, the white witch and the black witch. I say a witch is using evil powers regardless of color, and there's no such thing biblically as a distinction between a black or a white witch. For now, however, let us simply say that a witch is a medium, as the Bible defines the term, a medium who uses occultic phenomena to bring about what they call good or evil. Anton LaVey, founder of the Church of Satan, has spent a good deal of his time, as you might imagine, researching witchcraft both in the United States and Europe. LaVey has pointed out, and I believe quite correctly, that there is no such thing as a white witch. That is pure mythology. He believes, and I agree with him, that all witches are drawing on occultic power which does not originate with God. This is a very excellent observation, which we should keep in mind as we analyze this subject on the program. Now, the Bible is very clear on this fact, that God is the source of the power of goodness and Satan the source of the power of evil. This simply means that if you are not drawing your power from the Lord, it is obvious that you are getting your power from another source, and that source must be satanic. Now, some people call this power source by different names. For example, Anton LaVey does not believe in a personal devil, as we understand him to exist from accounts found in the Bible. Some people call this source of energy by different names, elemental force, magic, or control over the elements but it's clear that this power is drawn from a source other than God. The real acid test here is that we are admonished to put this evil away from our midst. Apparently, the Holy Spirit felt strongly enough to expand on this point, so there is additional counsel for Christians. The Bible says, beginning in verse 5, And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death, because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage. Witches are all around us today, not only in Bible times, but in the contemporary world. There are literally thousands of covens all over the United States, as well as untold thousands of practicing witches in England and different locations throughout Europe. Witchcraft has pagan origins, rituals, and worship. Many witches prefer to call these ancient occultic practices Wicca, which is the old English word that the term witch is derived from. Wicca is defined as wise one, or back to nature. The initials are also used for a witchcraft newsletter called the Witches International Craft Association. There are all kinds of varieties of witches and or pagans. 
Many of them say that they acknowledge the supremacy of the feminine deity, the goddess who is called, sometimes, Diana or Aphrodite, and that they practice magic. Many witches claim that they don't even believe Satan exists, much less worship him. In fact, some witches or pagans go to great lengths to disassociate themselves from Satan worshipers. Ultimately, that is who they are worshiping, but they have been deluded by Satan into believing something very different. To learn more about the origins of witchcraft in America, some members of our staff traveled to Salem, Massachusetts, near Boston, to get the real story. This analysis begins with our reporter, Regina Sippel, speaking from the home site of the Reverend Samuel Paris, where witchcraft supposedly began on the American continent. Watch. This is what's left of the home of Samuel Paris. He was formerly a merchant in the West Indies. He came to Salem in November of 1689. It was here that he changed occupations and became a minister of the gospel. He brought with him three slaves from the West Indies, including John Indian and his wife, Tatuba. It was said she was very proficient in the art of black magic. It was here that a group of girls met every evening to practice magic. They began to believe these things, and subsequently they alarmed the town. They began to have fits and convulsions, and at that point, the doctor said that they were bewitched. The girls blamed innocent people for making them that way, allegedly people they didn't like, or so goes the story. First blamed were Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tuba herself, the woman who started it all. Because of what started here in this place, witchcraft began on the American continent, and between March 1st and September 21st of 1692, 10 people were convicted and executed as witches. The gallows worked overtime. On September 22nd, eight more convicted witches were executed. We came here to Danvers, Massachusetts, formerly known as Old Salem Village, to examine the evidence that exists on witchcraft from 300 years ago to today, from both a theological and historical perspective. To obtain a historical perspective on witchcraft, we talked with Richard Trask, who is the archivist of the Peabody Institute. What led up to the terrible tragedies that occurred in 1692? That's a hard question to really answer very briefly, um, uh, primarily because a lot of people still aren't sure what brought about the witchcraft hysteria. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, after the hysteria was over, beginning really in 1692, people started writing about it. And since that time, there have been over probably 250 major works on the subject of people trying to interpret what happened and why it did happen. Uh, I think one of the important factors that brought about this witchcraft uh, frenzy in uh, late 17th century Massachusetts were uh, external factors which uh, affected the uh, Salem Village population. Uh, this was a period of uh, civil unrest uh, this was a period when um, Massachusetts had had its charter revoked, uh, the charter which allowed people who lived in uh, Salem Village and other parts of Massachusetts to own their own property. So they weren't sure if they were going to actually own the property that they had farmed for, for many generations. You always had problems with uh, Indians and the French, and in 1692 you had the beginning of a, uh, another Indian war, very close to home for the Salem Village inhabitants. You had ministers continuously preaching that um, the Puritans had been backsliding, they weren't as religious as they had been uh, in previous uh, generations, and therefore God was going to uh, rebuke them. Uh, so there are a number of external factors in the colony which brought about certain unrest in uh, Salem Village. The village itself was kind of unusual in that it was almost in a political vacuum. They belonged theoretically to Salem Town, uh, although the villagers didn't want to be part of Salem Town. Uh, Salem Town was much more of an urbanized area where mercantile development was taking place, and the village was agricultural and separated by uh, five to ten miles and uh, a whole different concept of, um, of life and uh, the people who lived uh, in the village had constant problems um, with their ministers. Uh, one minister had been 
forced to resign. Uh, two others had uh, left a very 